This is the environment. A cold, dark world, covering more than two-thirds of the Earth, yet alien to mankind since the beginning of his evolution. A hostile world, in which surrounding water pressures increase nearly 15 pounds per square inch for every 33 feet of depth. This is the environment. A rich world, abundant in resources, the food, the minerals, the space man will need to maintain the future quality of life on our planet. And these are the men who will conquer this environment. Aquanaut, trained by the United States Navy to lead the way into the sea, to withstand its rigors, to meet its challenges, to reap its harvest. These are the men being trained to adapt to life at ocean bottom, to overcome its many hazards, to use new kinds of tools in new ways so they can do productive work to tame this new frontier. These are the men who will take part in the Navy's continuing Man in the Sea program. Target to penetrate the secrets of the deep sea. The challenge for man to do so while being able to live at the tremendous depth. Waiting for the aquanauts on the continental shelf will be an ocean floor habitat. And there will be special underwater tools which they already will have been taught to use. But in the final analysis, True progress in unlocking the secrets of the sea will depend on the aquanaut's ability and stamina to survive in this most hostile of Earth's environments, where one slight error can be the last. And that very survival itself must depend on, and will be a direct result of, the mental and physical training specially developed for a special breed of men, the aquanaut. <laughs> In preparation for the sea lab experiments, men are selected for aquanaut training at Navy installations all over the country. And our rings will be sitting out here with the plow anchor. All right, old Marley, real still now. Don't move. Top physical fitness is a prime requisite. Each man is thoroughly checked, and baseline performance data are established for each candidate for later comparisons. Standard electrocardiogram and electroencephalogram tests are made, as well as more sophisticated measurements, such as the pedal-driven ergometer, to determine cardiopulmonary functions. There's no evidence that you have any neurotic... But in this preliminary screening of potential aquanauts, Equal stress is placed on metal attitude. A battery of penetrating psychological tests is given to each man. How will they react to various situations? How will they adjust to living and working as members of a team for an extended time in a closed environment? How will they react to the constant vigilance by television monitors? No, sir, I don't. I want to thank you very much for performing. Under the expected constraints, and the unpredictable hazards of undersea life. Sure Each man must have not only physical strength, but also courage and strength of character. And these are the For what is being tested and honed in these potential aquanauts, whose average age is 35, is an ability to learn and to apply mature judgment. After the physical and mental tests come weeks of classroom instruction on diving physics, saturation diving, decompression, sea life, marine biology, and a general overview of ocean science. Diving School, Washington, D.C. Weeks of intensive training in hard hat diving. For some, 
a new experience. For others, a refresher course, a chance to sharpen their abilities. Learning how to handle an air hose and to adjust for neutral, negative, and positive buoyancy. For a man in the sea must know his own limitations and often confine his activities to a narrow zone of operations. They practice salvage procedures, handling a cable cutter and oxy burning equipment. In hard hat diving, a man's time on the bottom is brief, and his body absorbs only a small amount of the mixed gases he breathes. This absorbed gas mixture must be released from his body gradually in predetermined decompression stages as he rises to the surface. The sea lab assignment would call for divers to descend to 600 feet, to live and work at that depth for 12-day periods, a demanding physiological adjustment and a demanding new phase of training, Key West, Florida. Here at the Navy facility, the aquanauts use scuba equipment with breathing gas mixtures similar to those they will use in Sea Lab itself. To sustain a 600-foot dive for 12 days, the aquanauts are thoroughly trained in the use of semi-closed breathing gear and in the new techniques of saturation diving. Deep beneath the sea, the aquanaut's breathing gas will be a mixture of helium and oxygen. After 24 to 30 hours, his exposure to this gas under pressure will completely saturate all of his body tissues, making them equal in pressure to the surrounding atmosphere. Once this happens, an aquanaut can extend his diving time indefinitely without undergoing additional decompression time. This phenomenon promises to allow them to become more than just a brief visitor to the ocean depths. During this training period, each aquanaut candidate learns how to operate controls, how to decompress a complex, how to regulate its atmosphere, and the operating principles of the life support system. This scrubber uses lithium hydroxide to purge exhaled carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. The aquanauts also mix all the gases used on the dives. Stop the compressor. Close the discharge valve. Discharge valve closed. Understood. Close the bottle valve. Have a good run now. Thank you, sir. Following many months of indoctrination, the aquanaut trainees are now ready for the next big challenge, to experience the effects of saturation diving. A couple of weeks, yeah. Okay, you know what to do now. In this chamber at the Navy's experimental diving unit in Washington, D.C., pressures can be adjusted to the desired depth. To prepare for ocean floor operation, a series of simulated dives are conducted. First, at 200 feet. Then at the 450-foot depth. And finally, to the equivalent of 600 feet where water pressure is 270 pounds per square inch, almost 20 times normal atmosphere. A medical technician tests the aquanauts during these simulated dives and monitors instruments sampling atmospheric conditions. All observations are relayed to supervisors outside the chamber. The men had withstood the test with no adverse effects. Now they are ready for an even greater test. A saturation dive to a simulated depth of 825 feet, where under pressure 25 times greater than sea level, they would perform the kinds of work to be done in sea lab operations.
gas reference hoses are attached to the Mark 8 equipment, transmitting to outside observers. The cardiac and muscular responses of the aquanauts is the exercise. All the energy draining discomforts of living and working on the bottom without ever going to sea. One of the problems of life in the ocean floor aquanaut dwelling is voice communications. For research purposes, each man tapes a series of 50 words. The helium in the mixed gas atmosphere they breathe is very light, and sound waves travel twice as fast in helium than in normal atmosphere. At a pressure many times that of sea level, the effect of this combination of conditions on the sound vibrations and pressure on the vocal cords is distinctive. As the Aquanauts training shifts to the West Coast, the work and study schedules are balanced by daily physical exercise. Muscles are limbered by calisthenics. Stamina is built by cross-country runs along the California roads of Point Loma. Reflexes are sharpened by competitive sports. Now, training turns to open sea diving exercises off the coast of California at Anacapa Island. Work with sea lab equipment and safety procedures are stressed. During these open sea practice dives, the aquanauts increase their proficiency in use of several types of semi-closed breathing apparatus. At all times, they live by the first rule of diving. No aquanaut works alone. Two divers, operating as a team, are always alert for each other's safety. The men who are becoming aquanauts and who will develop the potential of the sea cannot work with bare hands alone. They need tools. An important part of aquanaut training involves practice with new underwater tools they will use in sea land and beyond. Operation of even the simplest tools takes practice because here in the sea, the buoyed weightlessness of a diver offers little resistance to his efforts. An aquanaut tends to turn along with the drill. To overcome this, a restraining belt must be worn. Of the men who would become aquanauts, some must also be builders. And so their training includes projects in underwater construction, such as using lift devices, pulleys, and special hardware. Here they assemble three large steel rings onto a dry storage or work area, prototype of future installations or submerged bases. Salvage work is also an important part of the ocean floor training program, lifting large objects from the sea bottom to simulate the recovery of a wrecked ship or plane. Aquanaut photographers train for the additional task of filming underwater activities with specially designed cameras and with portable television equipment that transmit instant visual information to a habitat or a surface support ship. And as the aquanauts prepare to enter this underwater frontier, they learn to push back its limits by experimenting with new devices, a system of handheld sonar or a pinger locator to help them home in for safer navigation in the deep, sunless waters of the continental shelf, where nearby objects can be quickly lost from sight. The Navy aquanaut, deep sea diver and explorer, technician and researcher, pioneer and builder. The aquanaut, a man in peak physical and mental condition, ready for any underwater emergency, product of a training program to prepare him not only for the Man in the Sea project, but to accept the challenges to come, spearheading a new era of exploration and discovery in an ever-expanding conquest of the ocean world for the benefit of all men everywhere.